So as governor of Wisconsin, you faced huge challenges. They were all over television and it included an attempted recall. You're the first governor in America history to defeat an attempted recall. You didn't stand down and you're still standing today. <laughs> I would love for you to share with us a little bit about how you made it through those difficult times. It must have been extremely challenging and there was no precedent at that time for making it through a recall. For all you knew, you were going to be bounced out of there. Uh, tell us a little bit about that story and how you made it through. Yeah, you're right. In fact, after the early wave of protests, Time Magazine had a headline that said, Dead Man Walker. Uh, they thought <laughs> I was toast, I was done. Once they got the signatures for the recall ballot, uh, they thought it was all over. And, and even before that, uh, you know, we had death threats against me, against my family, against Horrible. my kids. There was one that said they were going to gut my wife like a deer. They had another one to my wife that I was going to be the first governor assassinated in Wisconsin. It's just horrible, horrible thing. But it was all part of that intimidation process. And, and more than politics or ideological beliefs, it, it, for us, it boiled down to prayer. Uh, we, we rely on our faith, our family, and our friends during those really trying times, first with the protests and then throughout the recall process. And I got to tell you, it was just so powerful. I, I remember after the first week or so, wisely, we took a, another page out of Ronald Reagan's playbook and we got out of the Capitol and literally went out around the state. We, we just said, okay, enough of dealing with the protesters. We're gonna, and we had protesters out around the state too, but we went out to people uh, we went to factories, went to schools, went to hospitals. And I remember the first time I was touring a factory about a week after the protest started, and I'd been praying extra hard and asked friends and members of our congregation to pray with us as well. But I went to this factory and, and I was touring and this gigantic guy all covered and, you know, he was he had uh, grease on from the equipment he was working on all over his clothes. And he came up to me and he put his finger right in my chest. And I thought, oh, man, hmm. he's going to let me have it. And he said, I just want you to know every night my wife and I and our kids, we get on our knees and we pray for you. Mm -hmm. wow. I was like, oh, so powerful. Uh, so from that point on, I remembered particularly something that uh, has stuck with me over the years. You know, in the, in the Bible, one of the stories I'm drawn to is the woman who had been unclean for a dozen years who heard Christ was going to come through a courtyard. And she went and just tried to touch the very end of his cloak. And he turned. He could feel that someone had reached out and, and, and reached for him. And, and I said, from that point forward, when someone would tell me they were praying for me, I would literally just might touch their hand, might touch their elbow, might touch their shoulder. Mm. But you could feel the power of that. And I just realized if you're doing the right thing and, and you're asking for God's help and assistance, the rest will work itself out. Oh, that's really powerful. Thank you for sharing that. Yeah. yeah I, I, we, were, we were all just mesmerized. I remember that. <laughs> you know, watching from afar and uh, rooting for you. I think it's important to, to highlight, though, uh, Governor Walker, that you, you haven't won every battle you fought, <laughs> uh, but you also haven't given up. Yes. So, for example, just recently, uh, you, fought, you fought hard for uh, a candidate that you supported uh, for in this election in the Wisconsin Supreme Court earlier this year, but it didn't go the way that you hoped. And uh, there is some belief that the, the person who got elected could play a role in trying to uh, reverse some of the things that you accomplished as governor. How do you keep standing after experiencing a disappointment like that? How do, how do you keep going? Well, it's a combination of things. When I think about when I, I was first uh, a young man in college, I ran for the state assembly, as was referenced before, and, and I lost. I, I, I was wise enough to know that in a district that was overwhelmingly Democrat, I couldn't win. In fact, the woman who beat me is now the congresswoman from the larger area in Milwaukee. Uh, but it, I went out and worked hard. I felt like there should at least be a choice for voters. I went into some pretty tough areas in the city of Milwaukee, uh, and that actually helped me later, not only because a few years later when I was 25, I was elected in a nearby suburb of Milwaukee to the state legislature. But a few years after that, there was a big scandal in Milwaukee County, the largest county, uh, a very Democrat, but but not radical like Madison, where our state's capital is at, but the traditional Democrat area. And I said, somebody's got to run for this spot and try and clean this up. Well, they'd never elected a Republican before. But I think in some ways that earlier quest that was a failed attempt in terms of a loss actually had opened my eyes to not being afraid to go to neighborhoods, to talk to voters, who didn't always look or sound like me, but who I knew shared some of the same concerns that I had. 
And I ended up winning that election and not only won, but was reelected in a, in a county that went two thirds for Barack Obama by about 60 percent of the vote. Well, we won in our reelection. Why? Because we did the things that we said we were going to do. We kept property taxes down. We restored public safety. Mm -hmm. We took on the corruption. To me, that's a great lesson going forward that sometimes you lose things, but sometimes losing if you have a long term goal, it's not just it's not just about you, but it's about pushing a, a larger, uh, a larger, better plan really goes a long way. And that same thing's true now with the Supreme Court race. Yeah, I just think that's a great motivator going into 2024 in Wisconsin across the country um, that we can't just look back and be upset about uh, failures or supposed losses in the past, but rather say, OK, what do we need to do going forward hmm. to make sure we mitigate those things, that we get better and we learn from that and we do a better job of articulating our values in a way that people respond to them? That's that's powerful. That reminds me of what Kelly and I often talk about how sometimes the victory is simply in the standing. Yeah, hold the line. Yeah, hold the line. Yeah. Um, and along those lines, we've, we've all heard the old adage, you know, pick your battles. Not every mm -hmm. fight, right, is worth, worth fighting. How do you decide whether to take a stand or to take a seat? Hmm. Well, some great lessons from the past. Uh, not surprising, I go back and I think of something involving Ronald Reagan, but 1964, Barry Goldwater ran in what everybody thought was just a very uphill battle. Not only did he take a stand, uh, but, but in the last week, people forget about this, literally a week out from the November uh, 1964 election, Ronald Reagan, who wasn't even elected official at the time, gave a speech we now call a time for choosing. And, and a lot of politicians, a lot of political figures who may be thinking ahead to the future would say, oh, I don't want to be associated with a candidate I know is going to lose. But Ronald Reagan instead embraced that. He not only supported Barry Goldwater in that speech, equally, if not more importantly, he laid out what it meant to be a conservative. He laid out, in fact, we share that with a lot of our students at Young America's Foundation, because if you go back, and I would tell people, go and Google, go either and read or, or watch it. It's, it's on YouTube. You can find it listen to or read that speech at Time for Choosing from October of 1964, you'll hear comments that could just as easily be told today. In mm -hmm. particular, one of the stories he mentions is he tells the story of two businessmen, friends of his, who were talking to a businessman who had come, who would immigrated from Cuba to the United States. Uh, and they talked about kind of laughing and saying, oh, how lucky they were. And this guy from Cuba said back to them, how lucky you are. He said, are you kidding me? I'm the lucky one. I had somewhere to go. If you don't stand and fight for freedom here uh, in America, there's nowhere else to go to. Wow. That's in 1964. Those are Ronald Reagan's words. You could give that speech today and be just as impactful. Wow. That's a good point. It reminds me that every generation has a battle mm -hmm. that it has to engage in to protect freedom. Uh, to protect our civil liberties, whatever uh, the landscape looks like, we all have that that responsibility. And a lot of what you're doing with YAF is preparing this next generation to do precisely to do precisely that. Uh, we're coming up at a break in about two minutes, but I was going to pass it on to Kelly to to ask the next well, question. I want to touch on yeah. the you were talking about the battle. I want to touch on that battle back when you were governor. And mm -hmm. you were talking about the death threats and the threats, those horrific threats against your wife. Mm -hmm. You know, the people listening would hear that and go, oh, my gosh, I don't have anything to do with anything like that. Right. Um, we've had similar things happen to us. What I've learned in that is I'll pull back on and go, you know what, they're just doing this to intimidate me. They, you know, the 100,000 protesters, which um, the liberals would call something else if that was at the D.C. Capitol. Right. Um, <laughs> yeah. But they're just doing that to intimidate you with the goal of discouraging you and getting you to sit down and be silent, to to not take a stand and to stop doing what you're doing. So I realized, well, I can't give them what they want. <laughs> and so it has just motivated me to continue to press forward. I, I was wondering, how do you, you know, when, when you're sitting there in the dead of night and those threats come in and you're not surrounded by your support group and stuff. How did you think through it? What would you tell those people listening who are like, well, I don't want that to happen to me. And so right. then they do get intimidated in silence. How did you press through that to say, no, I'm actually going to step forward? 
Well, in addition, again, it began and ended every day with uh, my knees, and, the, and, and then I slept like a baby after that because I knew mm. you just gave it all up to God. Mm. But in addition to that, I, I would tell you that, you know, bullies only win if we're intimidated by them. That's right. And, and so not only for leaders, you know, people who run like you and I and others out there, but but I'd say this might sound like a, uh, for a moment an odd correlation, but, you know, we think of things years ago like the civil rights movement. Yeah, Martin Luther King obviously was a, a major leader in that, but but you don't have Martin Luther King unless you had Rosa Parks. Right. Rosa Parks didn't give big speeches. Uh, she had the tenacity in her own quiet way to move from the back of the bus to the front of the bus, and that moment inspired literally millions of other people, many of whom would be scared to death to speak or run for office, but to do their own part in that. The same is true today in the fight for freedom. Yeah, some of us are called to lead by standing up and running for office or giving these speeches. But a lot of other people are, are called to, mm. to help defend freedom by supporting those who do that, by praying for them, by helping their campaigns, by supporting young people and sharing their message. There are many ways to be involved in this battle. 